Welcome to this presentation from the Downey Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are located in the greater Los Angeles area at 9820 Lakewood Boulevard in Downey, California. We would love to have you worship with us any Saturday you are in our area. Happy Father's Day to our dads. Um, we're glad that you're here with us, and we're glad that uh, dads, you're uh, hanging in there. So uh, I promise that today I would not beat up on the dads, so we're, we're going to do that, all right? We're at the end of our Rags to Riches series. First week, Pastor talked about um, you know, where our riches are stored up, in, on the earth or in heaven. How do we store riches in heaven? What does that mean? Last week, we talked about is God always first in our lives? Sometimes God kind of accidentally gets demoted from first to some other position in our lives. We didn't even mean to, but it just happened. And today's message is, don't worry, be faithful, which is a blatant ripoff of the old song, don't worry, be happy. You guys remember this? Bobby McFerrin, 1988. All the kids are looking at me like, what are you talking about? I wanted to play part of it for you, but our copyright license doesn't cover that. So here's a few lyrics from it. it starts out, says, here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. In every life, we have some trouble. But when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry. Be happy. Another verse says, ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry, be happy. Landlords say your rent is late, he might have to litigate. Don't worry, be happy. Look at me, I'm happy. Last verse says, ain't got no cash, ain't got no style, ain't got no gal to make you smile, but don't worry, be happy. Because when you worry, your face will frown, and that will bring everybody down. So don't worry, be happy. And if you remember the song, and if you've never heard the song, your homework is to go look that up and listen to that so that you can be properly schooled and don't worry, be happy. But it, it's a happy little song. It's a fun little song. It's got an upbeat little melody and, and tempo, and, and it, it does make you feel happy. When I was working on this message, that song kept you know in my head. And it does make you feel happy. But, you know, sometimes... That's easy to say and hard to do, right? When life has got you by the throat and really holding you down, it's hard to be happy, right? Because happy comes from external things that happen to us, right? If Gustavo comes up and hands me a $50 bill, I'm happy. If Gustavo comes up and stomps on my foot, I'm not happy, right? External things control my happiness. But when we say, don't worry, be faithful, you can always be faithful. Because faithful is something you decide to do. It doesn't come from external stimuli. It comes from internal stimuli. And you can always be faithful. Let's look at the verse we've been in, Matthew chapter 6. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're in verses 25 to 34 this week. Give me an amen when you get there. Matthew 25, Matthew 6, 25 to 34. This is a uh, little uh, passage that we're pretty familiar with probably if you've been around church very long. And it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? 
They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Ouch. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them, lunkhead. Right? Can you hear Jesus kind of like, are you guys getting this yet? For seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of his own. And we've heard that. We know that. We know that. But again, sometimes when life has got you by the throat holding you underwater, it's hard to do. Right? It's hard to do. And we could look at nearly any story in the Bible for faithfulness, because almost all of the stories in the Bible boil down to faithfulness and whether they faithfully followed God or not. But the story we're going to look at today is the story of Joseph. It's found in Genesis 37 through 41. We are not going to read that whole thing. It's, it's far too long. But you can turn there. We are going to look at a couple passages there. And I want to hit just some highlights and remind you the story. We probably all know the story of Joseph, unless you're new and you just wandered in today. Then, you know, you've got a second piece of homework to do to go read Genesis 37 to 41 and learn the story of Joseph. But remember, we pick up the story of Joseph. He's a spoiled little brat. Okay? He was. He got the coat of many colors. He has the dreams about everybody bowing down to him. And then he tells other people about that, right? Why was he the spoiled brat? Because he was the first son from the favorite wife. Remember, Jacob works seven years to win Rachel and gets tricked into Leah and has to work seven more years for Rachel. Then Leah gives him like uh, four sons, six sons, I think. Four sons? I don't remember. Four sons. And then handmaids get involved and they're giving him sons. And then finally, the last two sons come from Rachel, and she dies during childbirth of Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin. And so Joseph is the favorite son. And not only is Joseph the favorite son, but dad sends him out to check on the brothers and bring reports back. Now that's got to make you popular with your brothers, right? Because if you bring back a bad report, they don't like you. But if you don't go back and tell your dad the truth, you're lying to your father, right? So he's in a tough spot. And the brothers really don't like him. And dad sent Joseph out to go see what the brothers are doing. And after walking for a couple of days, he finally finds them. And they grab him, tie him up, and sell him to a bunch of slave traders. And Joseph has just got to be going, what happened? Right? And all of a sudden, he is being carted away where some slave traders are taken. He probably doesn't know where he's going. He probably doesn't speak the language. And away they go. And the Bible doesn't tell us this, but I think Joseph does some growing up on that trip. Um, because we see that he's sold to Potiphar. Remember Potiphar? Potiphar is the captain of the guard of in Egypt. Egypt is the world power at the time, so Potiphar's house is an important house. And Joseph works his way up to the top where eventually he's running the whole house. And the Bible says that Potiphar only had to think about what Potiphar wanted to eat that day because Joseph took care of everything else. Pretty good for a slave. And then Mrs. Potiphar enters the picture. Uh, dun, 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 bad music. Right? She sets up Joseph, and Joseph gets sent to jail. And now remember, Joseph could have done what Mrs. Potiphar wanted him to do. He's a slave. You have to obey your masters. And he could have just said, well, you know, I've got to do what i got to do. 
but he didn't. They get sent to jail. Then remember the cup bearer and the baker for Pharaoh are sent in, and they have dreams, and God helps Joseph interpret the dreams, and it's not so good for the baker, but the cup bearer is going to be restored. And Joseph says, tell somebody about me out there. I don't deserve to be here. Now, Joseph has gone from favorite son to slave. And slave's got to be about the lowest rank in society except slave in prison. And I, I don't know what's lower in society's rank hierarchy of citizens than a slave in prison. Dead, I think, is the only thing after that, right? Um, so he's pretty low. And he's fallen pretty far. And he says, tell somebody about me. I don't deserve to be here. The Bible tells us two full years later, which probably means it was longer than two years, Pharaoh has a dream, and the cupbearer remembers. He says, I know somebody that can interpret dreams. And Joseph gets cleaned up, brought before Pharaoh. He interprets the dream. And Joseph gets the all-time humdinger best promotion ever in the history of the world, right? From the lowest person in society to second only to Pharaoh. I, there's never been a promotion before or since like this. I mean, this is just an amazing promotion. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But right now, I want you to think about and put yourself into Joseph's shoes just for a second. Okay, we reviewed the story. You guys are probably familiar with it. You've walked for three days to find your brothers. They tie you up and sell you for 30 shekels of silver. By the way, I looked that up. 30 shekels of silver is about eight ounces. And at today's prices, that's less than $200. <laughs> Ten brothers, $200. Simple math, right? They didn't make a lot of money on this. Okay. If you're Joseph, do you feel like God has sure been faithful to me? Here I am in chains being hauled away from home. Are you feeling God's faithfulness? It would be difficult, wouldn't it? You're sold as a slave. It takes you years to work your way to the top of the house, and that whole fiasco with Mrs. Potiphar happens, and you find yourself in jail. And jails back then were a whole lot worse than jails today. Are you feeling God's faithfulness? It's like God's really watching out for me now. Things are really headed my way. Is that what you're feeling? That's not what I would be feeling. Now, we can give the easy answer. Well, God's always for me. You know, God, even when, even when things are down, God's for me. But do you really feel that way? Now, you get that awesome promotion to second in command of Egypt. Now, how do you feel about God? Yeah, God really came through that time. Right? Now, if you're Joseph and you're second in command in Egypt and you got a wickedly cool carriage and a nice team of horses to pull them, you don't have to drive. Somebody else drives. You just get to stand there and look cool. Where are you going? Right past Potiphar's house. Right? <laughs> look, at, look at this. Right? We don't have any record of Joseph doing that. We don't have any record of Joseph doing that. See, because Joseph was pretty faithful. Look at Genesis 41, verses 15 and 16. This is Pharaoh has had his dream. They've cleaned up Joseph, shaved him, washed him up, put some clean clothes on him because, boy, you smell bad when you're in prison. And they bring him up to Pharaoh. 41.15 Pharaoh says to Joseph, 
I had a dream, and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said that, you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And what's Joseph say? I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Now, how badly does Joseph want to get out of jail? Like bad, right? I mean, who wants to be in jail? What would you say or do to get out of jail? Most anything, right? Now, I might not just say, well, I can do it, but I would try and make sure that I was included, right? Yeah, God will give me the answer, and I, Mr. Important, will give it to you, Pharaoh. You need me. You can't cut me out of this deal. You can't go straight to God yourself, right? Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph says, I can't do it. Now, you run the risk of Pharaoh going back to jail with you then, right? What do I need you for? That is faithfulness. See, because we should be working for God and not ourselves. And Joseph is working for God. Now we can say, well, he's a slave. Of course he's not working for himself. Yeah, but he wasn't just working for Potiphar or the jailer or whoever. Joseph is working for God. And that's why he's not afraid to say, I can't do it, but God will do it. And I think this tells us just about everything we need to know about Joseph. You know, he's, he's taking care of God's work, the Lord's work. He's being as faithful as he can be. Now, Joseph wasn't perfect. He didn't always do all the right things. But he was doing the best he could do and being faithful. And that kind of reminds me of our dads on this Father's Day weekend. So many of our dads are working so hard to take care of their families, take care of their wives, take care of their kids, make sure things are going well, maybe even taking care of extended family, parents that age or other people in the family that need help. And they're working hard and getting it done. They're being faithful. Amen? And I know that anytime we talk about Mother's Day or Father's Day, there's somebody out there that has pain or issues because not every dad was great, not every mom was great. Or maybe mom or dad was great, but they passed away and we miss them horribly, and so there's still pain there. But I know this. We want to keep encouraging the moms and dads to do a great job in this world because we can change the future with good parents. Amen? And good fathers take care of their families. And ladies... <laughs> Sometimes you might get upset at us because we go to work too much and we can get a little bit off track, okay? And you're like, well, why don't you come home once in a while? Just remember from his point of view, he's doing what he has been trained to do his whole life. Be faithful and take care of the family. So be easy on him, okay? You, you can nudge him a little bit. It's all right. But be easy on him, because he's doing what he's been trained to do, and work hard and take care of the family. Reminds me of a story we're not going to look at right now, but where Jesus tells Peter to feed my sheep three times. Remember this? This is after Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection. Peter does what during the crucifixion or before the crucifixion? Denies Jesus three times. And afterwards, Jesus comes back and says, Peter, do you love me? Well, yes, Jesus, I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Well, yes, I love you. Take care of my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Quit asking me. Well, then take care of my sheep. There's a whole lot of symbolism going on there. But I think that command was not just for Peter. That command is for all of us. 
to take care of the sheep. To take care of we're the sheep. Right? God refers to us as the sheep. Take care of the sheep. Take care of the lambs to help out. And so I have something I want to talk about real quick as we wrap up today, and that's our kids. And this weighs heavy on me sometimes. I was interesting that Pastor prayed for the things that keep us up at night because this keeps me up at night. What are we doing with our kids? And Pastor will attest to the numerous times that I call him and say, can we do this? Can we try that? Can we drive him crazy? Pray for Pastor because... I think sometimes he hopes I forget his phone number. But it, this keeps me up. What are we going to do to encourage our kids? What are we going to do to get our kids here, to be in Sabbath school so they can learn the stories, so they can learn about Jesus? Because they're not going to learn that in public school. They're not going to learn it watching TV. Probably not going to learn it watching YouTube might be some good YouTube channels out there, but they're in the minority, right? What are we going to do? And I'll be honest with you, I don't have any great ideas yet, but I'm still working on it. So I, I want you to do something with me. VBS is just about one month away, just slightly longer than one month away. So every day, every day, seven days a week, every day, between now and then, one month of prayers, I want you to pray for our kids. For three things. I want our kids in Sabbath school and church. I want our kids to love Jesus. And I want our kids to be in eternity with us. Can you do that? One whole month. Because it's important. It's important. Our reflection is, are you worrying too much? Or are you faithful? Because I think if you spend time being faithful, the worries seem to fade away. The problems don't go away. They're still there. But the worries fade away. Be faithful. And then our challenge, you already heard me say it, as a parent, as a father, as a Christ follower, I'm asking everyone to pray for us for one month for our kids, that they will be in Sabbath school, that they will love Jesus, that they will be in eternity with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our fathers, Lord, and our mothers who are doing the best they can do, who are being faithful, who are trying as hard as they can to do the right thing, Lord. Encourage them, be with them. To our fathers and our mothers who maybe have some room for improvement, they're wondering, what can I do to be better? Be with them, Lord, that they can improve. Lord, but I want you particularly to be with us all as we think about ways we can support our kids and that we can take care of the sheep like we were instructed to do to make sure that they will be here at church, that they will have a dynamic relationship with Jesus, and that they will be in eternity with us. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen.